Hi there, this is David and welcome to our review of Soul Hackers 2, released for the PS4, PS5, PC, and Xbox. The SMT series has been around for many years, beginning on the original Nintendo and lasting to present day, with a whole lot of spin-offs too, but some are much more successful than others. The first Soul Hackers was originally released for the Sega Dreamcast and then ported on over to the PlayStation but it languished in Japan until it shockingly received an enhanced port to the 3DS roughly 15 years after the original release. And that's where I was finally able to play it. And I had a good time with it, so I was pretty psyched to play the sequel. But how does it stack up, and is it any good? Let's go ahead and find out. First things first, let's go ahead and get this out of the way. This is no Persona 5, and this is no SMT 5 either. This is much more of a budget title, but that doesn't mean that it can't deliver on the fun factor and have solid gameplay, even if it is lacking in all the bells and whistles. Customization options abound. You can choose English or Japanese voice acting, both of which are very well done, three different difficulty levels, and a plethora of options on the PC version, which is where I chose to play the game, including having unlimited frames per second. The story takes place in the mid-21st century, when technology has become stagnant and the world is on the brink of destruction. So Ion, a being who normally just watches over humanity, has decided to intervene to avoid an apocalypse. So out of kind of a technological ether, Ringo and Fig are created, and they're pretty much just supercomputers stuck in human bodies. And they're tasked with saving two men who hold the fate of the world in balance. Well, one man, a tragically coiffed engineer, is a lost cause, the other, Arrow, our resident devil-summoning hottie, is saved through the power of soul hacking. When Ringo first comes across him, he's dead, so our heroine has to hack into his soul and piece him back together. It turns out that there's two dueling demon summon organizations, and Arrow is a double agent who has infiltrated Phantom in order to protect Milady who is your next party member, and who's also a Covenant holder. The Phantom organization is hell-bent on collecting all five Covenants so that they can summon the Great One and usher in the Apocalypse. I actually really like the storyline, even if the main characters themselves were extremely forgettable. Soul hacking was neat though, where you see snippets of their childhood, adulthood, and eventual death. But there's also further elaboration on that because later on, you'll be able to enter the Soul Matrix, where you can unlock special abilities for your party members, as well as learn more about them, their history, and increase your bond together. The gameplay is kind of like a mix between Persona and SMT, insofar as you have dungeon crawling exploration and demon recruitment, mixed with bonding events and town exploration normally found in the Persona series. Here, Tokyo is at your fingertips, so feel free to explore the nooks and crannies back alleys, and go shopping. Talk to all the NPCs, have a drink at the bar, fulfill some side quests, or fuse and combine demons. There's plenty to do in the overworld. The dungeons, though, are their own beast. They really haven't evolved much since 1997, while the rest of the game seems to have evolved over the past 25 years. The dungeon design didn't. It's pretty much just a series of connected hallways, and each corridor looks just like the last. And this, my friends, is my main number one complaint of the game. The dungeons are all the same, and there's really only like three of them, and you just keep on going back and forth to the same dungeons over and over and over again. And even then, it's all just super long, boring corridors. It's uninspired to say the least, but they did do a couple cute things with it. Most notably, the treasure system. Instead of finding items yourself, you send out your demons to scout, and when you see them, they'll give you whatever items they found, heal you up, or introduce you to a demonic friend who would like to join you. And thank God the negotiation system is simplified. Here it's more akin to bribery. The demons will ask for one thing and as long as you fulfill their one request, they'll join you. They no longer ask for like six different things, rob you blind, and then laugh in your face as they saunter off and not join you. 
Monsters are encountered on the field, and if you attack them first, you'll get a first strike. Or you could always just slash them and keep on running if you'd rather not fight them. But the battles are actually surprisingly fast and fun. The innovative press turn system first introduced in Nocturne has been pushed to the wayside in favor of the Sabbath system, which is pretty much the press turn system but just simplified, and honestly I kind of like it a little bit better. Whereas enemies could take advantage of the press turns too, with Sabbath you only get the benefits. Basically, whenever you hit an enemy's weakness, the Sabbath gauge fills and at the end of each turn Ringo will unleash the Sabbath demons to deal massive damage to all the enemies, so you'd better be targeting those weaknesses and take advantage of it. Quality of life improvements abound too. Weaknesses are easy to see because the game keeps track of it. They're all shown on screen, and if you have a demon in your party, all of the resistances will be unlocked, making the battle system fun, fluid, and intuitive. Also, you'll be forewarned whenever you get to a dangerous area or boss, which is so nice because you can save anywhere. Then, there's teleportation points scattered throughout that you can use to quickly and easily travel throughout the dungeons. And, during the many cutscenes, you'll be presented with choices, which will increase a particular party member's soul meter. And, there's no guessing games here. The game literally tells you exactly who will get how many points for each choice made. Then, as you get more and more soul points, you can travel further into the soul matrix. For a seemingly simplistic looking game, there's actually a lot under the hood. While I don't condone Denuvo or Day One DLC in any way, I didn't want to focus on that here. I wanted to focus on what the game itself has to offer. And I had quite a bit of fun with it. While I do know that it's not the caliber of Persona or SMT5, it's still a solid game. But it's really made for those SMT super fans out there. So if you fall into that category, this is the game for you. If you like monster capturing or dungeon crawling or a fast, fun, fluid, turn-based battle system, then pick this up. It's just kind of a throwback to the 90s and the glory days of JRPGs and I am here for it. As long as you go in with some tempered expectations, I think that you'll have a good time as well. So, that's it for my review of Soul Hackers 2. How did you feel about the game? Did you like it or not? Please let me know in the comments, and if you like this video and what I do here on the channel, please consider heading on over to Twitch for some streaming fun, checking out Patreon for some exclusive videos and early access to my content, or coming on over to my Discord channel to chat and hang out. The links to them all can be found in the video description. This has been David, and if you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and have a good day.